Good afternoon, everyone. We're delighted to welcome you to this online webinar in conjunction with the launch of a local iteration of the internationally traveling exhibition from Aston University in the UK, Behind the Wire, Civilian Internment in the British Empire, 1914 to 1919. The exhibition explores German and Austrian civilian internment in the British Empire from 1914 to 1919, the duration of World War I. In addition to showcasing existing ex exhibition material, the Barbados Museum has researched and created four panels focusing on internment in Barbados during World War I. Speakers for the panel this evening include Dr. Glenford Howe, Professor Stephen Manns, and Jeff Ward, and the discussion will be moderated by Colonel Glenn Granham, the former Chief of Staff of the Barbados Defence Force. Many thanks to them for sharing their expertise and time with us in the launch of this exhibition. Before we get started, I would like to reiterate some of the Zoom housekeeping that was just shared in the chat. We encourage questions to our panelists. If you have any questions, please drop it into the Q&A section of Zoom, or if you're joining us via Facebook, please add your questions in the comments. At this time, I'd like to invite the Barbados Museum's Deputy Director, Mr. Kevin Farmer, to share his opening remarks. Good afternoon, and thank you, Natalie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our seminar that forms part of the public programming for an exhibition that opened today on Armistice Day at the Barbados Museum of Historical Society that takes a look at a not well known um, feature of World War I, and that is the internment of German and Austrian uh, civilians and those persons who were in the Austro Hungarian Empire during the First World War. Uh, my task this afternoon is simple, and that is to welcome you, and to welcome you to be engaged in exploring that little known facet of our history, to have a wider understanding of how war affects civilian populations, uh, both those that are directly on the battlefront or behind the battlefront, and then those in the wider theatres of war, and that is the context in which the Caribbean must be seen as part of that wider global theater of war uh, during the First World War. Um, so at this time, I wanna thank you for being here. We look forward to your questions uh, to our panelists, and more importantly, look forward to a stimulating discussion by our panelists. Gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you, Kevin. At this time, I'd like to introduce the moderator for this evening, Colonel Glenn Granham. Colonel Granham was a career soldier having served for almost 36 years in the Barbados Defence Force, the last four and a half of which he was the Chief of Staff, retiring on the 31st of August 2021. He currently works as the Director of Emergency Logistics and Policy in the Ministry of Home Affairs. In addition to many military professional qualifications and experiences, he holds a Master of Business Administration from the University of Surrey a Master of Defence Studies degree from the Royal Military College of Canada, and successfully attended programmes of study at the William Perry Centre for Hemispheric Defence Studies. He was a member of the faculty at the Caribbean Junior Command and Staff College in Jamaica, and Director of Operations and Plans in the headquarters of the Regional Security System. His research interests include regional and hemispheric security strategy, operations management, and leadership development. Thank you, Colonel Granham, for getting us started with this panel. And thank you and good evening, uh, Madam Manage Manager of Ceremonies, uh, Deputy Director of the Barbados Museum of Historical Society, Mr. Kevin Farmer, uh, distinguished members of the panel of experts, ladies and gentlemen in the audience, indeed our valued participants for this evening's activity, uh, good evening and welcome. And I want to give you a special thank you for participating in this evening's event, this afternoon's event. And also we note that today is a day of significance. The event of the 11th day of the 11th month in the year 1918 will always remember or always be remembered by us. And as today's event falls on Armistice Day, 103 years later, 
I think it is appropriate to use the words, we will remember them. And in so doing, pause in our thoughts and figuratively salute, uh, honor the courage and the sacrifice of all service persons worldwide, past and present, as we note their sacrifices to peace and stability in the world we live. But it was on the 8th of August, 1918, at the Battle of Amiens, that by the time the German army had rallied their forces from an attack by the British tanks near the city, by some accounts, as many as 75,000 men had been lost. And of those, no fewer than 30,000 were prisoners. And that was a previously unheard of scale of losses for the German forces. So how did the West Indies, and more specifically Barbados, fit into this global scheme of prisoner of war management? It gives me great pleasure to introduce the members of our panel of experts who will lead us in the exploration of the topic. And I'm sure a very robust and vivid discussion thereafter. Behind the wire, internment in Barbados in World War I. It's now my privilege to introduce the members of this afternoon's panel, starting with Professor Stefan Manns. He's a professor of German and global history at Aston University, Birmingham, UK. And he holds a master's of art from Freiburg University, Germany, and a PhD from Durham University in the UK. Professor Manns has written widely on global migrations during the 19th century, as well as on the First World War. His recent book is entitled Enemies in the Empire, Civilian Interment in the British Empire during the First World War, with Panikas Fanai. And he's particularly interested in new forms of communicating research to the general public. Outputs in his current project on South Africa in World War I include a virtual reality experience and a digital heritage application. Professor Manns is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society and a research associate at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Next on our panel is Dr. Glenford Ho. Ho? Sorry, apologies, Dr. Glenford Ho. Ho. He is from the University of the West Indies Open Campus, a thought leader advocate and author in higher education and cross-cutting socioeconomic issues, impacting education, including equity, gender, and the sustainable development goals in the Caribbean. He takes a holistic view and an ecosystems perspective on education issues. He is a product of the Montserrat Secondary School, the University of the West Indies Scafield Campus, and the Institute of Classical Studies School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. He currently works with the University of West Indies Open Campus based here in Barbados as a senior research program officer at the professorial level. And he's received formal education and training, especially in education policy and strategy. His do doctoral thesis entitled Race War Nationalism, a Social History of West Indians in the First World War, completed in just over two years, has been turned into a TV documentary by Channel 4 TV in the UK and published as a book. That book is made into a radio documentary by the BBC and is being used as one of the main sources for television documentary by the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Howe is also, has also produced the first book on HIV AIDS in the Caribbean, jointly with Professor Alan Cobley, and he's published various other disciplines, including history, politics, education, health, and child protection. He's authored many papers and books, technical reports, advising such agencies as UNESCO, UNICEF, UNDP, the Caribbean Development Bank, the British Broadcasting Corporation, CARICOM, and the governments of Barbados and Anguilla. In January of this year, he co-authored with the principal and pro-vice-chancellor of UE Campus, Cape Hill, 
the concept paper for a global campus, which the university is now in the process of establishing to reposition the institution for a post-COVID-19 world. And after that, in March of this year, Dr. Howe was appointed to the joint ILO-UNESCO Committee of Experts on the application of the recommendations concerning teaching personnel. A third among our expert panel this evening is Mr. Jeff Ward, who's had a lifelong association with the sea and with the ocean. That has led him to study maritime history of the Caribbean in greater detail. And he's at this time completing his PhD at the University of the West Indies, Scaphill, exploring the maritime and naval history of Barbados in the late 18th century. We are privileged to have these three experts, gentlemen, with us this evening. And I would invite you to join me in welcoming the panel and inviting them each to make their presentation, after which the forum will be open for questions and discussion and engagement. That being said, and as we welcome them, first to the podium virtually to speak and to give his presentation, I invite Professor Manns to lead off this afternoon's proceedings. Thank you. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Um, I'm uh, very pleased to be invited to join this panel discussion. Uh, and I'd like to really uh, thank the museum staff for putting on the exhibition. Um, I also have to say after this introduction that I'm quite honored to be part of this um, panel discussion because as was mentioned before, it's Armistice Day today. Uh, and as you might have noticed from both my name and my accent, uh, I'm a German national, although I have two passports now, a British one as well. Um, but I was born and raised in Germany. And um, I think uh, events like these and uh, exhibitions like these really show how the world has hopefully moved on, uh, that we can remember together, that we don't have to remember in separate ways. Uh, because that used to be the reason for many conflicts uh, and I hope this event and also the spirit of that exhibition uh, will show that a joint commemoration and, um, uh, and, and commemorating victims of the war uh, in, a, on a, in a joint way is a good way both for um, adults and for young people as well to be educated about wars. So. Um, the uh, title of the exhibition has been mentioned. Um, it comes out of a uh, book which I've just published last year. So this is quite a thick book, which probably only academics will read. Uh, so the, uh, the exhibition is really a condensed version with lots of images uh, and concentrating on the most important and relevant uh, points of that uh, issue that are interesting, hopefully, to the general public. Um, now, I'm very pleased with the way museum staff, the imaginative way uh, museum staff have, um, uh, have put the uh, exhibition up. Uh, it's in the courtyard, and I just took this picture to give you an impression uh, of the 18 panels, uh, which depict uh, that topic uh, on, on a global scale. Uh, and then a number of panels, uh, which I'll get to later, that have been specifically written for this local iteration of the uh, global exhibition. So briefly summarizing what the topic is about. Um, now, after the outbreak of the First World War um, in August uh, 1914, uh, there were about 50,000 so-called enemy aliens in Britain and its empire who were interned. Um, those were mostly German nationals, but also Austro-Hungarian nationals, Ottoman nationals, and Bulgarians. Um, most of these had migrated to empire locations, uh, had moved into civilian occupations, uh, and once war broke out, found themselves 
so to speak, behind enemy lines uh, and were treated as enemy aliens, as potential spies, potential collaborators, reservists who would rush back to the, or would, would have the potential to rush back to the, to the colors. Um, but uh, I need to stress in this context um, that these were civilians. So the, this is a different story that is usually remembered about soldiers and, and rightly remembered the story about soldiers. Uh, but what is very often not remembered in stories or the, the, the grand stories about the First World War and, and all wars is that civilians suffered uh, significantly as well. Uh, and in a way that exhibition is a way to make these uh, silent voices heard. So um, in order to detain those roughly 50,000, um, Britain and Empire Location set up um, more than 80 camps all across the empire. And the biggest of those camps was Nokalo on the Isle of Man uh, with just about more than 20,000 internees. So um, the new aspect of this book is that it takes on a global and imperial perspective. Um, previous research has concentrated on individual uh, countries or dominions such as Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and of course Britain. But uh, what I'm doing together with my co-author Panikos Panayi is to take on a global perspective and connect the dots between all these empires. How did all this actually work on a global scale? The arguments we are bringing forward is that Britain stood at the forefront of the first global mass internment operation of the 20th century. Uh, but it is very important to note uh, that conditions in camps were relatively humane. So these kind of camps can not be compared uh, to uh, other camps throughout the 20th century where inmates were treated in much more brutal and inhumane ways. And I need only to uh, remind everyone of the Holocaust. So we are not talking about the kind of Second World War concentration camps. It's a very different story, but again, it's a story that deserves to be told. Um, this was, as I just mentioned, the biggest camp in the empire. Um, this uh, is one of the many sources I found. It has a bit of German, which everybody might be able to read. Civil, civilian, prisoner, camp, no halo, Isle of Man. So this grew from a relatively small camp into a huge camp in the course of the war containing up to 30, 40 prisoners per hut. And these are the kind of confined living conditions they had to put up with for four or five years. You see the washing hanging down from the ceiling, uh, bunk beds here, and just very cramped uh, conditions. You also see that these are all only men, and uh, that's an important point, only men were interned, and that's different from the South African uh, war uh, around 1900, where men and women uh, were interned. Okay, so this is a map which appears in our book as well, which gives you a global overview. I'm not now going to go through all these camps, but it just really gives you an impression that this was really a global phenomenon uh, from the more than 20 camps in Canada, uh, right down to camps in, in Australia and, and New Zealand. Uh, and of course, you see Barbados here and uh, other camps. So th these um, all denote uh, islands where camps existed. So there was one Bermuda, Barbados, Trinidad, and Kingston. And another map, again, joining the dots, uh, allowed us to find out about deportation routes because most of the internees were not held at the place where they actually live, but they were deported and in some cases around the world. So many of those who had settled in West African colonies, for example, were deported to Britain. Or just to give one more example, um, those who had settled in East Africa, which was a German colony, today's Tanzania, then called German East Africa, most of them were deported to India across the ocean. So the British Empire really used its um, experience in deporting people, convicts, slaves, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, around uh, the world. They used that knowledge and expertise uh, in order to 
uh, deport uh, these or transport uh, these so-called enemy aliens as well. So those who were uh, detained on Caribbean and Atlantic islands um, mostly consisted of uh, the crew of ships. So if you were traveling between Southampton and New York, uh, beginning of August, for example, you would have been, uh, the, the ship uh, would have been detained, detained in one of the ports and all the so-called enemy aliens would have to leave the ship and would then be uh, placed into one of these camps here. Uh, and then um, some of the camps also uh, detained uh, some immigrants who had settled in, uh, in the Caribbean before the world before the war. So now for the exhibition, that was the broad framework. Um, and I'm, I've just copied uh, and, and pasted some of the uh, panels in order to give you an impression. Uh, so it gives a geographical overview of all the camps and all the dominions and, uh, and, uh, and regions where uh, internment happened. I just copied the panel on Caribbean and Bermuda here. Um, this is the Ports Island camp. It was basically a prison island, uninhabited usually. Uh, and this plan I found in the National Archives in London. <clears throat> this one is a picture from the uh, Up Park camp in Kingston, Jamaica. You can probably identify, hopefully, the barbed wire here. And palm trees and a bench where some of the internees would have sat. Um, although there was no physical mistreatment in these camps, um, mental health issues arose on a daily basis. Uh, just being detained, not knowing why you're being detained, because these prisoners had not committed a criminal act, they wouldn't know uh, when they would be able to leave, and their families outside, outside the wire um, very often fell into destitution because the main breadwinner of the family was interned. Um, so there was a lot of, and, and the sense of isolation, of course. Uh, so a lot of mental issues in these camps in order to um, avoid these mental issues, internees just kept themselves very busy. There's lots of cultural and athletic activity in these camps. Uh, up here is, I don't know whether you can see this on the screen, a Christmas party in the South African Fort Napier camp. Uh, here's an, a hairdresser in the Nokalo camp on the Isle of Man. Um, here's a bakery. You might be able to read this, bakery. bakery. Um, and here's a camp newspaper. So these are typical activities uh, internees would have entertained. Here's a, the, the panel on sports. Uh, gymnastics were, was a very big thing in 19th century Germany. So internees, in order to keep fit uh, behind the uh, wire, they um, did uh, lots of gymnastics, um, uh, and you can see here a football game in one of the British camps. Um, this is the final panel of the global exhibition, and it's possibly the most important one uh, because it explains that the issue of internment was not finished by the end of the First World War. Indeed, it's the other way around. The First World War really set a blueprint for the policy of detaining alleged enemy, civilian enemy groups uh, within countries, nations, states. Um, it really set a precedent and showed that this actually can be done. Uh, and we've got many iterations throughout the 20th century on this panel. I just copied a few ones. Uh, this is the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. Uh, this is the um, uh, the uh, gen the um, the Cambodian commemoration site of the Cambodian genocide of the 1970s, uh, and this is a typical um, uh, immigration detention center in the UK these days. Um, they look fairly similar these these places to what we saw in the First World War, uh, and the conditions are very often not much uh, better. Um, when I uh, did a workshop with a youth group yesterday around the exhibition, uh, they were quite interested in the Guantanamo Bay story, because that's exactly the same uh, kind of issue we're we are having, and again, that harks back to the uh, First World War. Um, now, the uh, exhibition was shown in 
various places worldwide in the UK, in Ireland, in Canada, in the USA, in South Africa, and now in Barbados. Uh, this is just one example from uh, the Fort Douglas Military Museum in Salt Lake City, obviously not British Empire, but uh, in the United States, enemy aliens were interned as well. So it, it really uh, resonates with audiences in the United States, that topic as well. Um, now, what all these local exhibitors have in common is they have uh, tried to localize the global story. I've just copied three examples here. This is a piece of the barbed wire that surrounded one of the camps in Canada, the Castle Mountain internment camp in Alberta. This is the exhibition uh, that was shown in Scotland and that glass case showed uh, a number of uh, items that were actually produced by the internees carved out of wood. Here we've got a picture frame, here we've got a toy. These are just examples. Um, and this is from the exhibition in Ireland, here are the global panels, and here is a bust of the Austrian Empire, which was created by the uh, internees behind the wire. Um, and that has survived in a local museum and is now exhibited in Ireland. And here is what colleagues in Barbados have done with it. Um, again, really pleasing to see how it was possible to, to localize the, the issue. Um, because as you might know, the Barbados Museum is located uh, in a former prison. Um, and the First World War internees were also accommodated in a prison. Uh, not this one, a different one, Glendary prison, but still it recreates the atmosphere of being locked behind uh, or in a prison cell uh, for four years or more. So this is the picture I showed you earlier. This is, these are the global panels. And then at the end of these global panels, you go into the prison cell, the former prison cell. Uh, and then on this um, wall, uh, you've got the panels that pertain to the West Indies and Barbados. Um, colleagues in the museum also asked me to read a letter that was actually written by one of the internees to the, uh, to the local police uh, pleading um, to be allowed to work outside the camp because that prisoner, uh, Otto Heinrichs was, a, was his name, uh, he was so desperate to get out and do some useful uh, work. Uh, so that uh, letter is read in conjunction with the local exhibits. And here are the three panels. I think we'll uh, hear a little bit more from other panelists about the, the general issue of the British West Indies and the First World War. Uh, and this panel is specifically about enemy aliens in Barbados and their captivity here in Glendary Prison, which is now decommissioned. Um, and uh, an interesting storyline is that of George Stade, who founded the um, a distillery uh, on the island in the 1890s. He had left for Germany again before the First World War, uh, but uh, was there accused of being a British spy uh, because he had lived in British Empire locations for a long time. Uh, and here is uh, the last panel about Barbados, about the, the treatment of these prisoners. And this panel um, also includes uh, two gravestones. I just copied one here uh, that uh, can be found in Westbury Cemetery uh, on the island. So I hope I've given you a good overview over the uh, exhibition and the actual issue at stake. And I'm looking forward to the comments from the other panelists. Thank you very much. Natalie, but does anyone want to moderate? Or Dr. Howe, would you just like to continue? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was saying that thank you very much, Professor Manns, for your presentation. And if we can take questions at the end of the third presentation, I think that might be uh, more appropriate. But um, we can we can do it otherwise. But if there are no um, no requirements to do at the end of each presentation, then we can certainly hear from, from Dr. Hull. Uh, 
All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you to the museum for having me today. Um, as I said, it's always a pleasure to get back to history, to my roots, and to do the things that um, I really love to do, other than working in the field of education. Now, um, what, I, what I'm trying to do in my own presentation today is just to provide a sort of context for how and why um, Germans and Austrians the so-called enemies um, were treated the way they were in, in Barbados and in the other Caribbean islands. Um, I have a little slide, a uh, short presentation. All right, so as you can see from the, 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 cover, the cover title, um, it's really about providing context. Um, so when, in, in, on slide two, the next slide, um, when the war actually started in, in August um, 1914, um, the colonies were, didn't really have uh, a right to neutrality because um, they were part of the British Empire. Um, but I argue in, in a book I produced for my PhD thesis in 1991, 93, um, this many years ago, that the, loyal, the loyalty of the, the people in the West Indies had more to do with the informal more than with the formal ties they had with Britain. It was in fact, I think, the informal ties which mainly determined the responses of the cosmopolitan West Indian population at the outbreak of the war. Over, over three centuries, um, I think most of the people in, in the West Indies had been conditioned, not all, certainly not all, um, had been conditioned as faithful patriots. And in many respects, social progress was in part measured um, locally by the extent to which the subjects in each colony um, exhibited British ideals and customs. Um, and as you will see in the next slide, um, this is a picture of um, Caribbean children at the time. Um, most people, most children in the Caribbean, I would argue, knew more about the, the British empire than they probably knew about, say, for example, Barbados or Jamaica. In other words, they knew more about the empire, the history of the empire and history of, of, of Britain uh, more so than they knew about their own national history. Now, when the war started, immediately um, the West Indian colonies sprang into action. And in the next slide, slide four, you will see that they made significant contributions, um, a thousand pounds in 1915, which would be worth um, 103, uh, thousand pounds today in 2015 money. Um, they donated rum, sugar, cotton, lumber, um, guava jelly, um, and an additional 54 million pounds. They also supplied airplanes and ambulances, which are um, shown in the next two slides. This is an ambulance that Barbados um, provided. And in slide six, you could see um, a plane which was um, supplied by uh, Dominica. Now, in terms of the recruitment of um, soldiers in slide seven, uh, from the time the war started, there were a lot of people who wanted, a lot of people wanted to go to, to fight. Um, and part of it had to do with the, as I said, the informal ties that and the bonds that people felt with the empire and with the British, the British, um, the British people. However, um, the local officials um, really utilized the, the propaganda material which, been, which was being supplied by, by Britain. And in this particular uh, recruitment poster, which was very similar to what you would find across, I would say across the, the, the British empire. Um, they appeal to locals to join, to, en to enlist and, and to come to fight this, this great enemy. And as you were saying, in this particular image, um, the war was characterized as one of life and death, a life and death struggle um, and a personal. So people had to, to take this as a personal matter. They had to step up, step up and, and come out and, and help to serve, to protect the, the empire. Now, the next slide, slide, slide eight, this is just showing um, a march through Kingston, Jamaica, as they started to recruit the early stage of recruitment. Um, the whole recruitment process was a long, 
involved a long battle. Britain did not necessarily want uh, blacks to come and fight with, fight against um, whites. It, it didn't matter that the whites were, were enemies, German enemies, none of that really mattered. Um, there was a lot of resistance against um, the, the whole idea of blacks coming into Europe to kill other whites, and that didn't sit well. But for this particular picture, you would notice that this was quite a, a, a quite an affair, a lot of pomp and ceremony. And if you look closely, you would notice that most people were out in their in their Sunday best. Uh, if you look at this the picture on slide nine, also, this is again a recruitment meeting. This one is in Trinidad. And as you could see, just from the hats alone, you could see that people were well-dressed. So there was a lot of significance, a, a lot of um, meaning to these uh, activities, the recruitment of the soldiers, and coming out to hear a lot of the speeches which were being made in order to encourage people to, to step up and to come out and join, join the fight against, against the Germans. Now, in, in the context of this, this, this whole environment, in slide 10, um, Slight and right speaks to the fact that brutal attacks were made against Germans and, and uh, Austrians. Um, immediately, the press, the West Indian press, got into action and they unleashed um, derogatory uh, descriptions of the Germans, calling them Huns, murderers, thieves, barbarians. Uh, martial law was declared, giving the governors wide range in power. You had strict censorship. Um, Germans, Austrians were rounded up, seized the board ships, and placed under arrest. They were ill-treated, robbed, and put in appalling conditions. Um, in Jamaica, they had about 700 alone. And businesses were auctioned off to help the war effort. Now, as I listened to Professor Miles, I kind of smiled a little bit. Uh, although I know he was presenting the, the global picture, um, in, in many respects, I would say that the situation here in the Caribbean was a little bit more ruthless and more vicious in terms of the treatment of the prisoners. Uh, and there was one, 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 one example, if you go to page uh, slide next, 11, um, I just picked out a few. There was Carl Bose in, in Trinidad. Um, he was charged with espionage. Um, and there was quite a long case, a case which was in the newspaper for a long time. Eventually, though, um, he, he was acquitted. But you, you could imagine the sort of damage which was done to his reputation and the stress that he was put under. Uh, one of the most uh, terrible cases, I think, was one for um, Paul Scherer, who was a prominent businessman, and he became the focus of an anti-German campaign led by the Mirror newspaper. His property was stoned, and demonstrations were held in front of his business. Now, the, the situation was so bad that even the British Colonial Office was quite alarmed at the events, partly because he was also an American citizen. Um, they, they nevertheless urged him to, to leave um, Trinidad. There was a story of, of Colin Campbell in Jamaica. He's an Englishman who was arrested aboard a ship going to Jamaica from Liverpool. He was handcuffed, his feet was bound, dragged to his cabin, and deprived of water, medicines, clothing, etc. He was totally humiliated in Jamaica. Um, and according to him, right, in his own statements, he was, he was arrested by three black, ugly um, native police. He spent one month in jail. And then since he was, um, he had been falsely, falsely arrested, due to forged um, letters, he was ordered, nevertheless ordered to leave the country. He had no money to leave, so he was rearrested and marched in the streets to the sound of a loud, loud bells and deported um, eventually. His story was one of real tragedy. Now for Barbados, um, in, in the case of Barbados, there was a lot, a lot of discussion about the spy peril. Uh, Professor Manns mentioned um, suspected potential spies and collaborators. So I think that's the key word here, potential spies and collaborators. Um, you know, urgent calls were made in Barbados for the government to adopt strict, strict measures to prevent the spy peril. One American woman living in Barbados who was alleged to have a German grandfather was forced to make a desperate denial in order to avoid arrest. The fact that she was not incarcerated infuriated, infuriated the Globe newspaper, which insisted there should be no other room but the barbed wire enclosure for any German seen in Barbados or any other of his majesty's dominions during this present crisis. There should be no quarter given on the score of class or sex. 
we have no desire to be hard upon any peaceful citizen who may be an alien, but events have proved the, necess the necessity for firm action, however unpleasant it might be. And it is the duty of this government to see that such firm action is taken. So, and you could understand, right? This is not a, a situation like in the United States or even other parts of, of Europe where if you are suspected or you probably thought you could be, uh, you would fall into this category of sus potential spy or suspected spy that you could probably go somewhere and hide. In these high, small islands, there was really no place for you to go. Um, so people were quickly identified and, and dealt with accordingly. In, in, in slide 12, um, so while I'm giving the, the, the impression here, you know, so that this overwhelming response to positive response to the, the outbreak of war and the support of the British Empire, and then the brutal attacks on, on the Germans and the Austrians. Um, there was also some dissent in the, in the colonies also. A lot of the liberal newspapers were quite annoyed by the fact that these small islands were really providing so much to the British um, war effort. They argued that we didn't have, at the time, that the colonies just didn't have the wherewithal, the financial capacity to be providing so much. But of course, th those sort of arguments um, were not really widespread. So generally, the, the, the atmosphere was one of, um, let us support the British war effort to the, the best that we could. Now, a, a very special or unique case, and this is a, a situation which you would find in the Caribbean, but you also it also um, was evident in, in South Africa, was that of the black middle class or black middle class politics. Um, they engaged in what I called uh, calculated patriotism. The liberal newspapers operated by educated middle class blacks and coloreds, for example, people like T. Albert Marish of Grenada, Etienne Dupuch of the Bahamas. Um, their philosophy basically was that we are willing to support the war effort, but in return for our demonstrated loyalty, we want, first of all, we want greater self-government, we want more representative government, and we want improved social and economic conditions for blacks and other poor people. So, their, their support for the war effort was in, in, in some respects conditional on them getting the things that they were asking for in terms of their own advancement within, within the, the region. Uh, slide 14. If, even slide 14, next one. Right, so even in the case of, of the black radicals, people like uh, nationalists like Marcus Garvey, now, at that time already, Marcus Garvey was already being viewed with great suspicion, and he was regarded as um, a great threat to the, to, to the British Empire and British activities in the West Indies. But in fact, he, he was able to send his support, express his support for the war. And the British Colonial Office, as you could see, uh, they had high praises for Garvey, although he, as a black nationalist, and his black nationalist agenda was already deemed to be a major threat to stability in the colonies. So the British government was really, really happy to have him at least express some support for the war effort. But of course, like the other um, black middle class, Gavi also wanted something. He was tying his support to, um, to participation. Um, his support and participation, participation in the war to the British being willing to give something after the war in terms of advancing the cause of black people. So that's basically the context which I wanted to, to provide for the situation here in, in, in the West Indies. And I, I know Professor Manns book look um, globally and it's quite an undertaking to do this on a global scale, a really remarkable undertaking. But perhaps now we also want some more, some more details on and the particular situation in, like, for example, in the West Indies. And I'm sure that uh, Mr. Ward is gonna give us at least a taste of some, <laughs> some of, of what, what actually happened. And the, the, the context, because even though I spoke about the, the whole situation of blacks being um, indoctrinated and so forth, as providing the context for, for the war and, and helping to explain, there are also much deeper roots 
uh, Mr. Ward is going to tell us a little bit more about those deeper roots, which are which are important to to how the the, the war effort and the how people responded to uh, the whole crisis in the, in the region. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Ho Hao. Uh, before we take um, the presentation from, from Mr. Ward, um, just by way of reminder that members of the audience may, and, and in fact are invited to place their questions in the question and answer the Q&A panel. Uh, instead of, of raising hands, the Q&A panel is indeed open and available for questions as you think them up during the presentations, as you make your notes. Uh, you can put them in the Q&A panel. So thank you again, Dr. Howe, for your presentation. And we'll move on to the third by Mr. Jeffrey Ward. Sir, you have the forum to make your presentation. Good evening, Colonel Graham, and thank you very much. And thank you to the Barbados Museum for having me. What I would like to discuss briefly this evening with you is the background leading up to the incarceration of the German Austrian prisoners in the First World War. Now, there is no, it's not an accident that that occurred. Barbados actually has had a tradition of housing British prisoners in the Caribbean, particularly in the smaller islands, in the Leeward Island Station, which goes back over 150 years. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Some are geographical, some are geological. We'll go through them and look at the progression. So initially, Barbados and the Leeward Islands, basically from Trinidad um, going up the chain, we were not the real focus of attention in colonial days. When you hit the 1740s, Spain really dropped out as a major player. It was Britain and France at that time. And the military, um, endeavors in the Caribbean actually focused on Barbados and what was known as the Leeward Island Station. During these wars, there would be many ships in the region and there would be prisoners from the British Navy or British privateers capturing enemy ships, uh, normally civilian ships, normally merchant ships, and bringing them into a British port. Now, where Barbados became important we'll touch on the geography first. Barbados was separated from the island chain by a hundred miles of sea, but more importantly, they were to the windward of the other islands. So it was very, very hard for enemy ships to come to Barbados. It was relatively easy for enemy ships to cruise up and down the island chain in the archipelago. What that means is that it was, um, Barbados was a natural prison. You couldn't come and stage a prison raid to get your prisoners or attack the island. In fact, in the American Revolution, the French launched five attacks against Barbados. Two were um, stalled by naval action, but three were stalled by the currents in the channel between St. Lucia and Martinique. From Barbados, the British could easily trade in cartels um, with France. So back in the uh, olden days, back in the, the colonial period, the, 17th, the 17th century a little bit, but mainly the 18th and early 19th centuries to the end of the Napoleonic Wars, the islands traded prisoners, uh, prisoner for prisoner. And they did that because there were small islands with limited resources. And the British would get their sailors back, the French would get their sailors back, the ships could be manned, and you reduce um, the need for each island to house, accommodate, and feed prisoners. This leads to another uh, very important part of fact about Barbados. When housing prisoners, not only were we 100 miles um, to the windward of, the, the, of Martinique and Guadeloupe, the, island, the main islands of the antagonist, uh, Barbados had an unlimited supply of fresh water in Bridgetown at Bethel Spring, which has now dried up. Not only did it have an unlimited supply of fresh water, from the definitely from the 1770s on, but probably slightly before, Barbados was one of the few islands that produced a multi-crop culture. 
And we know that the British fleet came to Barbados in 1780, 1781, and they said it's the only island in the Caribbean where fresh fruits, vegetables, and meat could be got in any quantity. So Barbados had the provisions to feed the prisoners. Barbados had the water um, to, to um, sustain the prisoners. And they had a port directly upwind of Martinique where you could easily exchange prisoners while being a natural fortress. Now, Glendary was, was started in 1853. It was finished in 1855. Before that, the main prison cells were at the old town hall in Bridgetown. And that is where all of the prisoners were kept. In the American war, particularly in 1780, there were over 900 people incarcerated. They said, ex not including debtors and local prisoners. These were Dutch, American, Spanish, and French. And it is a very small space. They said that they were exposed to much odour and that that blew across a quarter of the town, causing a lot of sickness. And it actually caused a major political problem in Barbados because the local assembly who were very independent for the day and were always trying to, to further their rights and gain independence from the metropole were in charge of the funding on the island. The governor could make policy, but the local legislature had to fund it. And they refused to rent any space for the prisoners. They refused to um, do anything but feed the prisoners. And then they sent those bills back to Europe. It was the local assembly's um, stance that the British brought these prisoners to the island and they were responsible for them. This then caused quite a lot of problems. Obviously, they had to be fed. They were actually um, given quite a lot of meat and they were given spirits, namely rum, four times a week. They were given a pint of rum four times a week. And it was quite an expensive thing to actually keep them here. But when you um, got down to the, the politics of it, it's interesting to note that until Glendary was completed, those same prisoners were kept in that town hall. It was a political um, argument that actually spanned the wars for empire leading up to the end of the Napoleonic Wars. So we have this context where Barbados, yes, it is a natural prison, but Barbadians do not want to keep prisoners. Yet they're making money off of the prisoners. Um, so it, it really is quite a complex scene. And many Barbadians were worried that if the French attacked the island, which we know they tried to many times, that the prisoners would run right in Bridgetown and they would burn down the shops. They would invade the taverns and, and basically just destroy the town in a riot. Now, what, has, what we have seen um, in the records is that after the great hurricane in October of 1780, a contingent of Spanish prisoners actually assisted the, the British government on the island in maintaining order while their prison was remade and then they were put on parole. So what I, what I would like to get over, and, and it is a very brief thing, is that there is a, a long and complex and very interesting road that leads not only to the construction of Glendary, but it also leads to the 58 prisoners being held there during the war. And there is a lot of history behind the maritime prisoners being held on the island, because that's what that's um, who we kept on the island. So I don't know, um, we have questions coming up. That's just a very brief overview and thank you for having me. Thank you, um, Jeff, and, and indeed to all the presenters. Uh, very interesting, very insightful presentations by all, and indeed, indeed, there was some discovery for me personally as to the scale of the operation of prisoners, holding transfers, and as well, enemy aliens, the social dynamic, uh, the geographic and geological, as um, Jeff 
Ward mentioned in his presentation there at the end, and as well the economics, certainly some of the colonies at the time making money from endeavors. So the floor is open. I would be kind, I would be grateful not to hog the show, so to speak, by having um, to launch the first question. So I will open the floor and not attempt to dominate the proceedings by myself advancing a few questions that I have um, that might be of consideration as the panel. So the floor is open. I'm seeing um, a question about to come up. Good afternoon, all. Yeah, you can proceed to your question. Okay, but well, while we wait for that question to be posted, um, and Professor Manns, if I could ask you, in your presentation, you described the activities undertaken by the internees at the various uh, camps across the empire. And you also, I think in one of your slides, was able to show some of the, the items that were produced uh, by one one particular camp in particular. Um, was there any evidence in your research of a wider harnessing of the output of the camps, the internment centers, a harnessing of that resource as part of a national, even more specifically, a military industrial complex to generate goods? Or, or provide services perhaps to, if not the particular colony, the particular territory, to the wider war effort in the UK? Um, so the uh, pre-war legislation stipulated that prisoners of war were not allowed to produce uh, 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 weapons that could be used in, in warfare. Uh, so that was out of the questions. They could not be, um, could, could not be used to, uh, to produce these. Uh, what some of the prisoners did produce um, are uh, the kind of uh, wood, wood the, the carving products, which I mentioned out of wood. Uh, and uh, in, in some cases, especially in the South African camp, uh, in some cases, uh, some elaborate tables and chairs and, and furniture, uh, and some of these were sold uh, outside the camp. Um, but whether um, prisoners were allowed to sell these and take in the proceeds, so to speak, of, of those products depended on the locality. So in South Africa, some of these products were actually bought by the general population, uh, but also mostly by German immigrants who had not been uh, interned, and uh, that would help those who were interned uh, to um, have a very modest income stream. On Barbados, um, the general popula population um, was vehemently opposed to uh, the prisoners doing any kind of work because there was large unemployment at the time uh, and uh, they, they were not very keen on any of the products that would have been produced in the camp to be uh, sold locally. Uh, so it really depends on the local, uh, on the locality. It's a mixed picture. Thank you, um, Professor Manns. A uh, question posted is for Professor Howe. And it asks, what was the name of the lady of German descent who had to pledge her loyalty to the colonial authorities? Well, I I don't I don't think I have the name um, 
I can't remember the name directly, but what I could provide is the source. Um, I could look at the source, so uh, the source will be able to, to perhaps indicate if there's a name attached to, 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 to the, the description of the person. So I think that, that will be helpful. So I, I would certainly send the source to, to the museum mm -hmm. and the museum could pass it on. Okay, thank you. And for Professor Manns, did the internment situation in Germany cause any political issues in Germany? Uh, by this, it is meant whether or not there was any lobbying done on behalf of families of the internees for their release, for better conditions, for visitation rights. Um, could you shed any light, any light on whether or not the internment situation uh, in Germany caused any political issues? Yeah, so this was actually a big issue um, within the wider context of the First World War, also being a propaganda war. Uh, and that's something we heard from Dr. Howe as well in terms of how do you mobilize um, populations? How do you convince them that it's a worthwhile uh, 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 war to fight? Uh, so the, the treatment of prisoners was very much reported in the respective other countries because some British nationals were also interned in, in German camps. Very few though in comparison and, and only after the British authorities started interning then the, the German authorities thought oh, what are they doing with why are they doing this we need to do something so they interned some British uh, nationals uh, in turn. Um, and yes it was widely reported uh, because within the propaganda war uh, the issue was who uh, who fights a just war, who fights for a just cause, and so how do we how do we treat our civilian prisoners? That was a kind of barometer of how just the war and just the, the cause uh, actually was, in order to convince the own population, but also the other kind of populations or warfaring nations uh, who was the more civilized uh, one. So the good treatment of prisoners to a large extent can be explained by this being part of the wider uh, propaganda war. So the, the answer to the question is, yes, it was. Uh, the problem for the historian is to drill through some kind of thing that resembles reality. Because as is the case with propaganda, a lot of this stuff is exaggerated or was exaggerated. Uh, some things were not mentioned here, but mentioned elsewhere. Uh, so what we did in our book is actually go to multiple archives, look at multiple newspapers from in, in different countries in different languages, and then try to, to filter out some somewhat what actually uh, happened. So this is a very good question. Thank you very much. Yeah. And to follow on a question for um, Mr. Ward, do you have any information about Barbados in its strategic importance as part of the Royal Navy's maritime strategy, their global approach and campaign during World War I? Yes, I, I do. Um, there really wasn't that much, to be honest. Barbados was strategically important, uh, particularly during the Age of Steel. And because once ships, um, got internal combustion engines and propulsion they and they could go upwind we lost our real strategic advantage now we hadn't gone to the point yet where um in the caribbean ghana and jamaica were providing masses of bauxite for the for the aluminium used in the us and we hadn't really gone to the point where, where submarine technology would allow the germans to come across the atlantic um the Kriegsmarine, and actually fight in the region so in World War I, I would say it, it was really quite small. Barbados has always been an intelligence station and it would have remained there. The garrison complex, the British troops left in, in 1905, but we had the, the British West India Regiment. And it wasn't really until the Second World War that things started picking up again with active uh, combat and action in the Caribbean. But during the First World War, not too much at all. Uh, thank you. And what would your comments or views be on the call out of 
the Barbados Volunteer Forces uh, around August 1914 as part of a need to shore up local defense from what was perceived to be a vulnerability of the Bridgetown port. Uh, prosperous at the time, important as a trading point and refueling stop for visiting merchant ships. What would be your observation on the, the call out of um, Barbados volunteer forces at the time by, I think it was Governor Probing, um, as part of local defense, bearing any relationship to the wider World War I uh, campaign and the UK's strategies? Right, okay, well, there are two questions there. The first one is the call out. Um, Barbadians historically have, have loved a bit of excitement and the militia has been called out on many an occasion when two, two sails were sighted and it turns out to be merchant ships. That being said, in the context of the lesser Antilles, the smaller islands in the Caribbean, yes, Barbados was important. And Barbados was important because Bridgetown was one of the main trading centers um, in the region. Larger ships, larger container ships would, um, well, not container ships, but larger cargo ships would come to Barbados. They would offload um, their foodstuffs, all of their produce from Europe. And the inter-island schooners would then take that, uh, those goods and take them to the various islands. We had the infrastructure to handle large volumes at the time. And that was important in terms of the region. So yes, it was worth defending. Um, obviously with the outbreak of war uh, during that time, information traveled not as slowly as centuries passed, but it still traveled more slowly. And governors have always erred on the side of caution uh, with the military. Now, if I could just take that a step further, Bar Barbados and the entire Island Schooner trade actually um, started to, to disappear when the other islands gained populations that made it feasible to construct ports and to have larger ships go to those islands and be able to offload the totality of, of their, um, their cargo. So it, yes, um, it, it made sense to take them out. We were um, important for the Caribbean um, and governors have always, have always called out the military um, in the event of war in the past 150 years. Thank you for your response. Uh, a further question from the uh, forum is whether or not any of the panelists uh, has access to any information about humanitarianism or charity extended towards the internees in the Caribbean detention centers by Caribbean-based groups like churches or other community-based organizations, persons who would be looking to assist those uh, enemy aliens or any prisoners of war purely on a humanitarian basis. Is there any evidence from your collective research of any such activity at the time? I can I give it. Please. I could give a more general account, and but whether that's that was the case in the Caribbean, I, I would not be able to say. Um, so support, a lot of support for camp movements came from the Quakers, the Society of Friends. Um, they were very active in the Nukelo camp on the Isle of Man, but also in other camps uh, around the world. Uh, so when, when it came to providing books, for example, uh, musical instruments, uh, and other things that uh, made it possible for, uh, for prisoners to keep themselves busy. Uh, so they were very active. Um, there were also, uh, there was the um, uh, International Committee of the Red Cross uh, that was actually, the Red Cross dates further back obviously, but the International Committee is really an, a kind of product of the First World War uh, that looked into uh, supporting uh, those. And then there were in 
um, many regions around the world local support committees, but it is important to note that these mostly came from ethnic Germans or Austrians. So ethnic communities, churches, congregations, ethnic clubs who provided their library, for example, for the uh, local camp. Um, usually, um, Germans, as we heard from Dr. Hauber, are not very popular uh, in British uh, Empire locations, and there is not that much uh, evidence of humanitarianism uh, being, being shown. Uh, but the, the local picture might be different, and my fellow panelists might be able to feed other information in. Thank you. I think this is where we need the, the, the research to, to for, on the local situation. So we could actually have a little bit more insight into the, 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 the particular circumstances on the ground in, in particular localities. But certainly one of the, one of the observations as I said, the, the risk of being perceived as, a, as a, a potential spy or collaborator was very significant. And even in the case of um, the, the, the Quakers, the Jehovah Witnesses and so forth, those who are called so-called pacifists, um, there was really a lot of attacks on them too in, in, in the Caribbean islands. And that, that in itself is a, another fascinating story, which needs to be, to be, um, to be, to be delved into and, and to be told, because uh, it's not very likely that they would be providing any help to Germans uh, and Austrians when they themselves are under real attack. Um, particularly because they saw them, the, the attacks did not necessarily start during the First World War. It started long before that. Um, they saw them as a sort of aberration to, to, to church in, in, in the region, in the Caribbean, in the, in the West Indies. And as such, um, so there was a long, a long um, history of hostility towards some of these groups. Um, so the likelihood of them really engaging to help prisoners, German prisoners or Austrian prisoners, um, was perhaps not the, the, the best, but we really need the research to, to delve into it to, to be able to know for sure. Can I make a comment on this? Would that be okay to have some conversation? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for these comments. Just two comments from my part. So um, you mentioned pacifists, and it's important to know that uh, German enemy aliens weren't the only enemies of the state. Pacifists were as well. Exactly. In, in, in some of the cases, they exactly. were actually interned together. In the United States, I showed a picture of the Fort Douglas um, military camp in, in, in Utah. And this is where ethnic Germans actually met pacifists. Um, so when you're a German, you're not naturally a pacifist. And they were complaining about each other, uh, that their attitudes toward the war were, in some cases, quite, quite different. Uh, but it really shows. Uh, how uh, these kind of in inverted commas enemy populations were treated and the pacifists in the United States were actually treated very badly. Um, the second uh, comment I'd like to make, and, and, and could I just say that the both presentations were eye-opening to me because I approach the issue from a global perspective and I, I've, I've taken a few case studies, uh, but it, it, it was so interesting to hear uh, what you had to say. Um, Dr. Howe, you mentioned uh, personal tragedy. Yes, I've uncovered a lot of person, the, the kind of tragedy you mentioned uh, around the world. So a lot of these stories uh, actually made, made their way onto some of the panels as well in the ex exhibition. So shop windows smashed and, and uh, especially uh, wives out the, outside the camp uh, really suffering. Uh, so lots of uh, tragic stories um, and also the kind of global Germanophobia you mentioned. The lady, uh, the, the, you put the source in the, uh, in the chat there. Uh, so that again was a global story. Virtually all newspapers in the British Empire were full of these uh, stories of allegedly unfaithful and uh, treacherous uh, enemy aliens. So this is where the global story really gains in, in relevance. So thank you both for your, your presentation. Again, uh, it, it was really eye-opening. Uh, thank you. A further question is for the panel as well, were there any Turkish internees held in the Caribbean during World War I? Um, I'll be happy to say a few words on this. Uh, I, I have not come across any. Um, the lists of internees um, have 
survived, some of them uh, not in the Jamaica camp, but the Barbados ones, the 58, I've got all the names and where they are from, and uh, they are listed on one of the panels. Uh, there's no Turkish national amongst them. I know this because uh, some of these tables give nationality and there were about three or four Austrians, uh, but the kind of Turkish nationality doesn't appear. So I can only talk about Barbados. The answer is no, I wouldn't know about the other islands. Uh, I should say though, um, they, uh, some Ottoman subjects were interned in the big camp on, uh, on the Isle of Man. Uh, and there are four or five gravestones still preserved in the internment camp cemetery, um, which are visited by the Turkish consul on an annual basis uh, and remembers those who died in captivity, those Muslim uh, internees who died in captivity. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And a further question in the question and answer um, window. Comments and uh, really give thanks by by way of appraising the topic as a very interesting one and asking specifically: Is there any information, any references to what happened in British Guyana? Uh, those with German and Italian names were interned. And, and can you also comment on the anglicizing of foreign surnames to avoid internment? I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to comment on British Guyana. I've, I've looked at internment locations and uh, wouldn't be able to comment on that. Uh, on the anglicizing, uh, yes, that happened throughout the empire, but there was one cutoff date where the British government decided where people are not allowed to anglicize their names anymore. Uh, so uh, yes, it was a feature at the beginning of the war, but, uh, but not towards the uh, end of the war. Uh, but many uh, who, who would be in turn, so this is slightly moves away from, from names, but nationality as well. Some of them would pretend they were Swiss or Swedish or anything. So they kind of uh, assuming different identities through names, through nationality was, was common practice in order to potentially evade um, internment. And for you, again, Professor Mann, to, to drawing another question, uh, how were German internees viewed in Germany when eventually they repatriated to, to Germany? Were they viewed as heroes, cowards, or was there ambivalence? Furthermore, how, how were they later viewed by the Nazi party come the 1930s and the dawn of the Second World War? Yeah, that's a very good question. And this is about forgetting. Um, so those who uh, were actually interned uh, felt a deep sense of shame, um, a double sense of shame actually. A, because they were not able to support the, in quotes, uh, quotation marks, fatherland uh, by fighting for the fatherland. Um, and they were also not able to support their families. They, their families were help, helpless outside the, outside the wire. So there was a kind of double sense of almost emasculation for those who, who were imprisoned. Um, and there, were, there was a fear that they would be seen as cowards. You, you used the, the, the person quest asking, used the right word, cowards uh, by the general population. This happened in some instances uh, but, but in very few instances, actually. But the, the kind of self-reflection of, of being helpless uh, and, and not being able to support the fatherland world was a very strong one. Uh, when they returned, they formed um, kind of help, uh, self-help groups. Uh, and this was also uh, to recapture the capital or the assets that were actually held by the British Empire. So there, was, there were a lot of expropriations. So, People were owning shops and, and had other assets. The, these assets were frozen and, uh, and uh, taken by the British Empire. So there were these self-help groups in order to, to regain uh, the capital that, that was frozen by the British Empire, but that was unfortunately to, to no avail. Uh, one 
uh, example is actually George State, who had moved back to Germany in 1901, but still had some assets within uh, Barbados, and he tried to get these assets back, but but wasn't successful uh, eventually. So that's a good, that's a good uh, good case study here. Uh, but it's basically a story of forgetting, and that's exactly what we are doing now with this project, uh, trying to to uh, memorialize those groups that are that have fallen through all cracks of memorialization because they, they did not return as in, in uh, inverted commas heroes. Mm -hmm. And by the time the Nazis came along, um, they, they again did not fit into uh, the kind of conception of war heroes. So they were for forgotten there as well. And then far bigger issues came along. So uh, throughout the 20th century, that group was forgotten. And what we as historians do, as I said, is just uh, recapture the memory of those. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Okay. Um, just a, 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 a further point on, on the, the, the issue of changing of names. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you could do that in Europe or maybe even in America. Um, but in, in the West Indies Island, West Indies, uh, that was really more a very difficult thing to do. Um, if you're white, <laughs> you're under scrutiny, right? And uh, the islands are very small, so people automatically know if you are British or if you are some foreign nationality. Uh, they might not know you're not your, your, your nationality for sure, but they would certainly start to investigate. So those were the, those situations made it very difficult um, for anybody to try to change the name to to escape um, escape capture as a, as a potential spy. Um, there were blacks uh, in in the case of Belize. A lot of people of Spanish descent simply regarded the war as having very little to do with them. And so when the recruiters came, they simply ran away. Because um, as you know, Belize, um, Mexico, and a number of these other countries uh, have, have joined physically. So a lot of them just simply ran off. And of course, uh, within the, the West Indies, there were the Blacks who, who really wanted nothing to do with the war effort whatsoever because of the evolving activities of people like Marcus Garvey um, at the time. Um, so those Blacks didn't, but of course they were in the minority and it was difficult given the overwhelming um, patriotism for people to have dissenting opinions um, against the war effort. And as you have the floor, doc, uh, Professor O, oh, um, did the Stallmeyer family in Trinidad come any come under? I'm sorry, did the Stallmeyer family in Trinidad come under any particular suspicion or scrutiny? Well, I cannot recall. I, I did this research over 25 years ago. Um, but certainly that is perhaps a, a, a matter that we could, that, that's probably worthy of um, further investigation. But it, it has to be done, I think, in the context of um, a, a broader appreciation of maybe, for example, the business community or foreign nationals in Trinidad who might have been businessmen or across the Caribbean. Because as I, as I indicated, people were very concerned um, about whether or not you were British or if you, if you were not British, then you were other. And as other, you automatically came under suspicion, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and the specific case of Stolmeyer that would take some investigation. And, and further, did any black nationalists at the time view the German imperialism as a lesser or greater evil than the British imperialism? Is there any comparison contrast as to how the, the black nationalist movement and, and leaders at that time would have viewed the Germans versus the British form of imperialism? Well, absolutely, Ab absolutely. There were, I just said a minor, a minor idea of, of blacks who, um, and not, we're not now talking about the, the middle class blacks, but the middle class blacks had their own particular politics going on. They wanted, they had political ambitions and so forth. Um, they had economic ambitions. Um, so the blacks that you're referring to were people who were <laughs> perhaps on the, more or less on the fringes as extreme black nationalists, right? Followers of Gavi and so forth. Um, a lot of them, yes, did, did express opinions. And of course, some of them were put in jail or charged for making seditious comments as, as so forth against the war effort. So you'll find those stories. And in, in, the book, in my book, you'll find um, 
you would certainly find stories this this in this book here which was done a long time ago you would certainly find a, a lot of stories about those sort of things and the manner in which the whether as soon as somebody expressed if a black nationalist for example expressed some sort of opinion like that um then you had the entire state come come down on you the new and the newspapers um you had the population coming down on you so in most cases people <laughs> i think were inclined to keep their views to themselves and those who were bold enough to express those views were treated um very harshly thank you how, how did anti-german sentiment affect the royal family um, um I, 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 I just want to preface this before professor man gets it here right but okay, he's the, he's the expert on this global side of but I, I saw an article recently about um, had to do with South Africa. It had to do with um, the, the, the German, the, the German um, William, um, and the connection to the British, to the British, um, uh, the British throne, the British mm -hmm. royal family. So it seems to me that there was some sort of familiar ties. Um, between all of these different people. And perhaps when Professor Mans is giving his response that he could speak to that, because a lot of people seem to be thinking that um, these are just enemies, but a lot of these were actually families. A lot of these um, monarchs were families across Europe. So perhaps you could say a little bit about that, that too. Yes, uh, there was were a lot of royal connections uh, from the uh, 18th century onwards. The, the, the Georges were Germans from, from Hanover and, uh, Going into the 19th century, uh, Queen Victoria was married to Prince Albert, um, who came from a small region in, in Bavaria. Um, Coburg Gotha uh, and the name of the royal family up to the First World War was Sachs Coburg Gotha, referring to that German uh, connection. Uh, and since we, are, we were talking about names in an earlier uh, question and name changes. The name Windsor only uh, came about during the First World War. So in order to symbolically cut those ties with the, in inverted commas, enemy, uh, that name change was possibly the most prominent name change globally. Okay, thank you. And further question as to were there any um, Black socialist presence in the Caribbean that gave an anti-colonial critique of the war at the time. Were there any active movements, of Black socialist presence, uh, who view the Caribbean's involvement in the war, either in support or in terms of the location of internment camps, providing food and supplies, and we saw in the presentations, vehicles and airplanes, how, how was the, the Black socialist movement in the, in the Caribbean at the time responding or reacting um, to such a contribution by, by the colonies? But certainly, um, as I mentioned, right, um, by the time the war started in 1914, the, the Black nationalist movement um, had already begun to develop um, and to take on certain characteristics. They had leaders like Marcus Garvey and so forth. But what actually happened, so, and you did find in fact that there were people, there were individuals who, who tended to, to say something negative about the war effort. But in terms of a systematic critique as such, um, there wasn't too much to my recollection, too much of that. Um, and that is why you find, for example, that the British were so happy when Marcus Garvey um, expressed his support for the war. The black nationalists realized too at that time that they had a stake in, in the war. And their stake was to try to, to have, um, get some advan ab advancement for, for their cause, for, the, uh, for black people, the conditions are improvement in the conditions of black people and so forth. And that is why when the war ended by 1918, uh, after the war uh, ended, 1918, 1919, that is why you had all this turmoil across the Caribbean, riots, strikes, um, cities like in Belize has been totally burned down and so forth, right? Because they were totally disappointed based on the treatment that the soldiers got overseas. And then the British, the British government wasn't really um, 
inclined. They might have, they never really promised them openly to give the things that they were asking for, All right? I think it was more on expectation on the side of the, of the black, the black um, middle class and even the nationalists that something, if they participate and if they supported the war effort, that something positive would come out of it, right? Much to their disappointment, that did not happen. And as a result, there were major strikes, major violence across the entire region. Um, and I would say that the, those strikes were only a sort of precursor to what would come in, in, in the 1930s, the major upheavals of the 1930s. Those strikes and, and that, because what it, what it actually did was to bolster, right, the arguments of the black nationalists and the arguments of the, the black middle class that uh, the British one inclined to, to give anything really, anything significant. They were more in, intended to maintain the, the status quo. And they, the blacks were not really, uh, the black nationalist movement, Gavi, um, the black middle class who had their own politics, they weren't really um, inclined to just sit back and allow that to happen. And so all of this was fermenting. So by the second, by, by the 1930s, you had terrible upheavals across, across the Caribbean, terrible, terrible upheavals, which would again change significantly the development tra trajectory for the region as a well. whole. Okay, thank you. Question for Mr. Ward. Was there any fear in the Caribbean that the German high seas fleet might attack any of the islands in the region? And by way of example, the UK archives record that a German ship known as the Karlsruhe had posed a threat in Caribbean waters and was particularly successful in sinking, sinking 16 merchant ships off Brazil before turning its attention to the shipping lanes between Barbados and Trinidad. Unfortunately, Charles Rue had an onboard accident in November 1914 and wasn't able to be as, as active, indeed, to have any measure of success in the, in the archipelago. But was there any fear that the German high seas fleet might be more effective or more impactful in its attack in the islands in the region? Mr. Ward. Right. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I couldn't tell you if there was fear or not right now, but I can say that there really shouldn't have been fear. Now, one of the, the big things that came about with, um, with coal and, and fuel oil, yes, ships could go upwind, but they really lost range. A lot of people don't realize that wind is a relatively inexhaustible resource. When you have to then fill ships, um, coal bunkers or oil bunkers, they, they have a much um, reduced range. The range is, is really quite small. And after the American War um, in 1782 is the last time the British home fleet actually left the UK to come to the Caribbean to defend it. Um, after that, it was 1944 when they went out to the Pacific. But the British were scared um, at that time to, to lose the economic uh, benefits of the, the Caribbean to the French. Now, you go forward 100 years, you, have, you can have the commerce raiders in Brazil and, and in the Caribbean, they're, they're single ships. And we see it with the Graf Spey at the Battle of the River Plate at, um, at the beginning of the Second World War. But to move a fleet is, is a horse of an entirely different color. Um, and the logistics involved with the smaller ships meant those big battle fleets were really limited to European and Mediterranean waters. Um, in the case of the Germans, uh, the Kriegsmarine and the British Royal Navy, you're looking at the North Sea. So while there were commerce raiders, the actual technical development of the ships had not come on far enough to really make it feasible to get them across the Atlantic in any, um, any sizable force. Thanks, thanks, um, Mr. Ward. Uh, just to revisit the question, the issue about British German royal families connections. The fact that the British royal family renamed themselves the Royal House of Windsor to distance themselves from the German lineage and to legitimize themselves somewhat in the eyes of the British people. 
Um, how is the, the panel viewing that as part of a response to growing tension within the British Empire, or indeed an anticipation of staving off any, any problems um, that might be coming up on the horizon? Which of those two forces, a response or a strategic action in the long term, which of those fo two forces, in the opinion of the panel, might have been greater in the renaming of the Roy British royal family? Yeah, um, sorry, the, the, the two forces again, I, I didn't acoustically, the, 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 what, what was the first and what was the second force? Yeah, it, per, perhaps it may be viewed that the renaming of the British royal family was an attempt to respond to that pressure and they need to distance themselves. Was it a response to that pressure that they were feeling at the time or maybe they were looking ahead and trying to preempt any any association that might arise in that regard? Uh, I think it was the pressure. It was part of a rebranding. Um, the, the, the kind of alienation between Britain and Germany had started uh, in the in the pre-war years, obviously, with the um, building up of the German fleet, the the the, uh, the navy laws, etc. Uh, so Jeff, Jeff probably knows a lot about this uh, maritime uh, part of maritime history. So that that uh, colon uh, that that um, uh, tension between the the two empires had had really been building up, and uh, I think the First World War was sort of the final straw in that rebranding exercise that was then expressed through uh, a name change. If I may add to this as, as well, just as an aside, um, it wasn't just uh, uh, family names or the royal names that were changed. Um, a famous example is the place name changes. So in Canada, can, um, Ontario used to have a town called Berlin, Ontario, and they changed that to Kitchener, Ontario, who is the Secretary of State for War in Britain. So there is this real nationalist urge, and it is it is related to place names as well as family names. It's, it's just a small aside. So perhaps part of the greater social dynamic and the social response to the war, and indeed feelings not just a nationalism, but in, in keeping the enemy at the arm's length and at bay as well. Uh, I'm looking for any further questions in the Q&A panel. Um, while I wait for any that may still be out there, you're having very good, uh, very meaningful and deep discussion, very quality, high quality, well-researched responses by the members of the panel. Uh, I was in my own research reading an article by the late Warren Allen, who in his article, his column used to run in the, I think it is the Barbados Nation, uh, commented on the Boer prison camp that was to be set up in Fortescue, never opened, uh, but the plan was to provide for punishment um, and, and the security of uh, prisoners from the Boer War. And interestingly enough, there was an act of legislator, le legislation an act of legislation passed in May 1902 to provide for punishment to any persons who might have been seen to be aiding or partisan to the Boers who would, were intended to be imprisoned there. Uh, any research of any members of the panel as to whether or not this particular provision, the arrangements for it, how useful were they in preparing the colonies for what then became the World War I situation? If I, if I may jump in there, um, it, it's a little bit of history that might help. Um, I personally, and, and, and everybody can please jump in and tell me what you think. The Boer War was really, as I understand it, the start of a concentration camp, meaning you took a group of prisoners and you concentrated them. Now, in the Caribbean, before that, we, there was a very um, distinct method of imprisonment. So you had prisoners who were well off, who were considered gentry, 
that would be placed on parole. They could have lodgings in town, they could go and spend their money, they could live as free people, having given their word that they would not um, aid the enemy in any way. This was also offered to enemy officers, um, both in the army and the navy. Then you had your so-called common prisoners who would be kept in the prisons because they could be trusted, because they were not of a social class. Now, when you come to the Boer War and you have this idea of gathering everybody, um, as said earlier, men and women in that war, not just the men, this notion of people going on parole and this differentiation, as I see it, really disappears and everybody gets put in a camp. And then that moves forward. And it's this real move from the 18th century, 19th century notion of war being somewhat civilized to this notion of total war, which really started in the American Civil War, hit the Boer War, and then was really manifested in the wars of the 20th century. I can add something else to it. Uh, so I'm glad you uh, you mentioned these uh, continuities. So the camp, as I understand it as well, was eventually not set up uh, for the Boers on, on Barbados, uh, but one was set up uh, in Bermuda. So there, there was a prison camp for, uh, for Boers who were transported to Bermuda, to India, to Ceylon and, and, and other places, St. Helena. In the um, in the Atlantic and uh, Atlantic Ocean as well, and uh, there are sources. I found one on the prison camp in uh, Ceylon, um, where one of the German internees comments, "Oh, I've, I've now been interned here, taken off a ship, and this is where only 15 years ago those poor Boers spent years in captivity, and now it's me." Uh, so there's a clear continuity between these camps and again these um, continuities of deportation throughout the British Empire between the Boer War and the First World War. Thank you. Thank you both gentlemen. And a question for Professor Manns. Is there any evidence that being interred in prison camps caused premature death? later in life, or in other words, did former internees die earlier and suffer such phenomena as PTSD or have poor quality of life in their twilight years? Um, this is uh, a question I actually was planning to pursue at some point, what would happen to the internees later, uh, but it has to do with the issue I mentioned earlier, the forgetting. Uh, many of them just didn't didn't talk about or write about what they actually experienced in order not to draw the, the kind of shame or the, or the perceived, perceived shame on themselves. However, when it comes to the, con the mental condition of those who spent those years in captivity, uh, there's one term uh, that was coined by actually a Swiss um, camp inspector, Fischer, who was also a psychiatrist. He, he coined the term barbed wire disease. So that's a specific um, mixture of kind of boredom, senselessness, frustration, uh, not knowing what would happen when, when release would happen, what's happening to the families, also sexual frustration. Uh, so that kind of mix um, uh, uh, played into that, what he called barbed wire disease, and there was a deep depression. Uh, and there are instances of suicide uh, behind the wire and, and uh, just the, the, the kind of all symptoms associated uh, with that mental depression. I, th I think I think too that the whole the whole the, there needs to be a whole discussion again about um, the whole mental health issue, not just for Germans or Austrians or people incarcerated, but also in in, in the context of the, the overall war. So you, then you would want to look at, at the soldiers and so forth. I don't think that we have seen enough of that um, for the Caribbean. Certainly, I know for the Second World War, there some studies have been done, for example, that showed very clearly that the <laughs> the, the British psychiatrists generally um, tended to misdiagnose conditions of the, the black soldiers and send them into mental asylums um, where they were just basically locked away um, without providing proper treatment and so forth for them. So I think that that's a topic in itself which perhaps need to be fully investigated 
by psychiatrists or people with um well training in, in, in that area. But it, I think it, that could be a really fascinating, a fascinating um a fascinating story, a, fa a fascinating thesis, I think. Could I add a comment on this? Uh, sorry, could, could I add a short comment on this? Uh, I think this is yes, um, yes, this is why the topic, this isn't just about the First World War, it's not just about Germans, this, this yeah. is about wider issues. We've just been through a pandemic, we have not even been through it, but we've had lockdowns and we had to stay at home and we were isolated, we couldn't really meet people. Of course, we now have the, the kind of online media which we are communicating with at the moment, That that, uh, but then again has different effects on our mental uh, state but um, the the state of being isolated for several years uh, that resonates with with uh, with many people uh, and there's a lot of work to be done I think for interdisciplinary research to to approach the sources which I have approached as a, or we have approached as historians but we are not psychiatrists we are not in the medical profession but it would really be interesting for uh, for those who know a little bit more about mental conditions to look at those sources and maybe identify uh, issues around them. And do we know when the pandemic will be finished? No, we don't. This could drag on for another four or five years. There might be another lockdown. Um, uh, figures are going up. Uh, so I think this is where history is really powerful to, to see uh, the kind of processes. How, how do these things evolve over time? Is there is there any information on how women may have been treated in these prison of war camps? Uh, sorry, did you say women? Women, and, and for that matter, any children, um, how they may have been treated in, in the prison of war camps? Okay, so um, the only male prisoners were in these camps. Women, as a rule, were not interned because they were, they were not potential combatants. Um, and there's also a gender issue. They were deemed not to be as dangerous as by your collaborators. So they, they, it's quite an interesting gender history to be, uh, to be uh, written there. However, um, there, were, uh, there was one women's camp in India but it was mainly to protect those women because they couldn't support themselves within that um, a very different environment. Uh, so it was mainly for their uh, protection. What they did experience, those who were not interned and, and um, uh, uh, stayed in, in freedom, uh, a lot of hostility. So a lot of um, alienation from their natural community surroundings, lot of, lots of hostility directed against them. Um, and this also includes British-born women who had married German nationals before the war because they would have taken on the nationality of their husbands. So these, this is, again, one of the many forgotten stories. So once the war broke out, British-born women, many British-born women actually found themselves as enemy aliens and were very often treated uh, as such in, in, in public. I have a question for Professor Manns, um, if, if I might share, that's okay? Yes, yes please. Right, and, and again, it's, it's a health-related issue too, right? And it has to do with the fact that during the First World War, um, <laughs> I mean, the British Army, I guess all the armies worldwide were dealing with, with severe um, health issues, uh, venereal diseases and so forth. Um, what sort of diseases um, existed in, the, in these camps? Um, what were the health conditions like um, in a lot of these camps? Uh, so the, the health was relatively good, actually, in these camps. Uh, doc British doctors were um, allocated to these camps and look, looked after the, uh, after the internees. Um, and the diseases, there was a bit of malaria in some of the, the African camps uh, because of the, the some, in some cases, the, 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 the dirty, some malaria, obviously, uh, through mosquitoes and then dirty water being given to the uh, to the prisoners and that had an effect on generally on their um, state of um, state of health. Um, some of them, some of those who were detained in West Africa and then transported to British camps actually arrived in those camps with malaria 
which is quite an interesting uh, combination. Um, but I, I have not found um, and much further. So the main issue is really mental mental conditions of these uh, internees. All right. So no sorry. infectious diseases. Or, sorry, yeah. A, a big topic. Sorry. <laughs> but, but, yes. mm. uh, sorry, I interrupted. No, no problem. I'm, I'm not seeing any other questions being posed. Uh, I have none other of my own. Uh, so I'll just at this stage do a very brief um, summary of what was a very rich and a very enjoyable presentation and discussion and engagement session. A lot of knowledge has been shared and I'm very grateful to have been invited by the Deputy Director of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society to have been, to be the moderator this afternoon. I also want to say a thank you to the members of the panel, Professor Manns, Dr. Howe, and Mr. Ward for what has been a fantastic session in not just learning about the specifics of internment behind the wire and, and internment camps in Barbados, but getting a better understanding as to the wider context of Barbados at war, the Caribbean at war within the framework of the British Empire during World War I. Of course, we've touched on so many issues, so many nuggets of, of information that it would be difficult for me to single out all of them, um, but certainly the need to do greater research on barbed wire syndrome might be an area to see how in later years that phenomena has become something more substantial, PTSD comes readily to mind. But through this afternoon's discussions and the questions, very rich questions posed by our very engaged audience, we were able to better understand the maritime strategy. Mr. Ward was very good at describing his views and based on his research as to how Barbados and the Caribbean fit within the global context. And also how the propaganda of the war, the economics, the social cohesion, the fractures that developed in Caribbean societies by virtue of the enemy aliens being taken out and, and incarcerated to bring all of that to life in an environment of understanding that I'm sure will be very useful to us going forward. I'm very happy to have participated and to have met the distinguished panel, equally important to have engaged and been the point of connection between a very interested and a very engaging audience. So I thank you all. And with those remarks and thanks, I will pass to Madam Manager of Ceremonies for what regrettably might be the close down of this. I think we might be coming up to the limit of time. Yes, thank you so much, Colonel Granham, for moderating what was a fascinating and brilliant discussion. Thank you to all of our panelists for joining this evening and sharing your expertise. And thank you to all of the audience members, both here on Zoom and also on Facebook. Um, we welcome anybody who is in the island to come and see the exhibition at the Barbados Museum. It's up in our upper courtyard until November 28th. Um, but for now, I'd like to wish everybody a good evening and thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.